It's a great pleasure to be here in Cambridge, right on the Cam, on a beautiful July uh, morning with Dr. Aubrey de Grey, one of the great well-known characters in our field and uh, resident of Cambridge. So I'd like to say good morning to you, Aubrey. Good morning, Phil. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for coming. Um, perhaps if I could start with the obvious question, which is, could you say a few words about your background and the positions that you hold today, please? Sure. Yeah. So I was originally trained not as a biologist at all, but as a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. And I did computer science research in industry for six or seven years, uh, during which I met my wife, mm -hmm. Adelaide Carpenter, who was at that time a senior professor at at the University of California in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And through her, I first of all, through informal means, learned a lot of biology, but then gradually became aware that gerontology, the study of aging, especially the study of what to do about aging, mm -hmm. was a real backwater and not studied nearly enough. So eventually I decided to switch fields and I was very fortunate to, first of all, have a few ideas that were well received and generally to become a reasonably um, respected member of that community pretty quickly, even though I was sort of doing it in my spare time at that point. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I began to have some ideas about how to really intervene in aging much more effectively than the ideas that had been around before. Mm -hmm. And that's really how things have gone from there. As um, Increasingly, I was able to get people interested, and especially as I was able to attract funding, a little bit of funding, mm -hmm. to pay for me to do some of this work, I was able to move out of the uh, more computing areas that I was in before, mm -hmm. and to become the Chief Science Officer of the Foundation, mm -hmm. a charity based in the US that is the main um, headquarters, so to speak, of our work now. Yes. We're based in California, we're called Sense Foundation, obviously we have a website, sense.org, uh -huh. and um, it's, 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 it's definitely a proper job now. That's great, good to hear, thank you. Thank you for telling us a little bit about yourself, Aubrey. And you mentioned there SENS. Could you tell us what that acronym stands for and what the organisation does? SENS is an acronym for a concept that I came up with back in 2000, mm -hmm. and it stands for Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, which is a hell of a mouthful. It has actually some justification in um, gerontological history, so to speak, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't generally use the full thing. We just call it SENSE. Yes, yes. Um, so SENSE essentially is about not just slowing down the clock of aging, but mm -hmm. actually turning it backwards, repairing mm -hmm. the accumulating molecular and cellular damage of aging. Mm -hmm. And the concept that I came up with, the general theme of research that I came up with back in 2000, was that this might actually be a very great deal easier than slowing the clock, which is mm -hmm. rather counterintuitive, but mm -hmm. it seems to be the case. Yes. And Sense Foundation is essentially built around trying to make that happen. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of research, both in-house in our laboratory in Mountain View, California, mm -hmm. and also in university labs that we support around mm -hmm. the world, mostly in the US, but not all. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, we are focused on making sure that as and when this technology actually comes into existence, mm -hmm. we can get it out there as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So we do a bunch of education and outreach of various types. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very interesting. So if you don't mind, Aubrey, may I ask you a personal question? What was it that first triggered your interest in, the, in this important ageing research? A lot of people, when you ask them, you know, how did they get interested mm. in, the, in getting involved in, let's say, the crusade mm. um, to combat ageing, they'll yes. say that they had some kind of um, you know, eureka moment, some mm. epiphany mm. that led them to understand that ageing is actually quite bad for you and that mm. we might be able to do something about it. I didn't have one of those. Uh -huh. I always knew perfectly well, ever since the dawn of time, you know, since I was a kid, I'm quite sure, that ageing is first of all very bad for you and it would be good if we could fix it and secondly that in principle we should be able to fix it in due course. Mm -hmm. The thing I didn't know was that pretty much everybody else thought otherwise. Mm -hmm. I presumed that everyone knew that and that you know that, that we didn't yes. talk about it much in the same way that we don't talk about um, other obvious things like you know the colour of the sky or whatever. Right. But um, then through talking to my wife especially and to other biologists especially senior biologists um, I began to uh, be aware that actually this wasn't the case, that uh, even biologists, let alone the general public, uh, took the view that ageing was not very interesting and not very important, and I was completely horrified, and mm -hmm. eventually I decided that there might be a chance for me to actually make a contribution to hastening the development of this technology, so it was a pretty much a no-brainer for me to switch fields. Yes, thank you. Interesting. Interesting. 
Now, as the editor of the Journal of Rejuvenation, obviously you have a lot of information coming across your desk all the time. And I was wondering, is there any a particular research that excites you at the moment? The thing about ageing is, of course, it does affect the organisation of the body at every level, molecular, mm -hmm. cellular, systemic. And so it's, you know, in order to be an expert in gerontology and the biology of ageing as a whole, mm -hmm. you have to be every sort of biologist, a cell biologist, a geneticist, a biochemist, a physiologist, and so on. And certainly at Rejuvenation Research, the journal that I'm the editor-in-chief of, mm -hmm. we publish a very wide variety of different things. We are still pretty much the only journal, certainly the highest impact journal, that is focused on intervention against ageing rather than just on understanding ageing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's very good to be in that position. Mm -hmm. But actually, yeah, I mean, the amount of information that we're talking about here, not only coming into the journal, but also coming in from other literature that we're, we need to stay on top of, is you know, more than I could do on my own these days. Mm -hmm. And I actually have one or two of my staff whose main job mm -hmm. is to actually monitor the literature and keep up with everything and, and identify type ways in which it might be mm -hmm. relevant to changing our research priorities, for example. Mm -hmm. Marvellous. Thank you. I imagine that a lot of people watching the film today might be saying, oh yes, I know uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Uh, he's often in the press. He makes uh, large, big claims about the possibility of longevity. Obviously, quite famously, that you, you've said that the person who might live to a thousand is alive today. I wonder if you could just explain a little bit how you think that's achievable. Well, the first thing I want to focus on is that my work is not really about longevity. Mm -hmm. It's about health. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in developing medicines that will postpone the ill health of old age. Mm -hmm. And I think it's absolutely critical that everyone should understand that the only way that we would ever achieve any substantial extension of how long people live mm -hmm. is as a side effect of keeping them healthy for longer. Right. We are absolutely not going to be able, it's just vastly harder yes. to keep people alive in a frail state than it is to stop them getting into that state in the first place or to restore them to a healthy state. Right. Right. And so that's what our work is all about. Anything to do with longevity is a side effect. That's but of course people are very much fixated on that aspect of it. That's how they True. think about things when you talk about intervening in aging. And so I have to give straight answers to, to straight questions. Thank you. And the reason I come up with numbers like a thousand for how long people would live once mm -hmm. we really get on top of aging, once we start to be able to control the diseases and disabilities of old age to the same level that we already control most infectious diseases, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the way I come up with those numbers is just by looking at the statistics of today mm -hmm. and saying, well, you know, how long would people live if aging already didn't exist mm -hmm. and therefore if the causes of death were simply causes whose incidence mm -hmm. is not dependent on how long ago you were born. Mm -hmm. And that's easy to do because you can just look at the frequency with which people die in young adulthood mm -hmm. today in mm -hmm. the West, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, are, if you reach your 26th birthday, mm -hmm. what is your chance of not reaching your 27th birthday? It's right. basically less than one in a thousand. Uh -huh. So if you maintain that probability of death each year, mm -hmm. however long you live, mm -hmm. then of course you get a number in four digits for mm -hmm. how long you would live, mm -hmm. on average. Mm -hmm. And of course some people would live a lot longer than that. There's some people would live less long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just like a half-life, just like a radioactive sample. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, it's easy to see that that's a very conservative estimate because, of course, we're also going to be developing other technology all the time that reduces the risk of death from causes that are not dependent on age. Yes. Um, so, so, in fact, I, um, I'm, I tend to be actually uh, quite coy in, uh, in, in terms of what's actually going on in terms of longevity. Yes. But, as I say, the key thing is it's all about health. I see. Yes, thank you. That's a very important point. Yes, thank you, Aubrey. I think that's a very important point. And I know that you and I both know that uh, people, a lot of people still think that by be, being older, they're going to be exposed to these diseases and disorders, and therefore they don't want to be older. And of course, we're talking about a new era where people will be older, but they won't be exposed to diseases and disorders. So in other words, they'll remain lucid and agile and independent, which is a very important point. And I, and I think you probably partly answered this question, but I'll, I'll just ask it again if I may. Uh, and that is, you, you see as a consequence then of maintaining health is, is extending longevity as well. The whole idea here is that the human body is a machine. Mm -hmm. The human body is a really, really, really complicated machine, but it's still a machine. And that means that its function is de defined, determined by its structure. Mm -hmm. So if by medical intervention we can maintain or restore the structure of the human body at the molecular level and the cellular level and the organ level, um, as, as it is in young adulthood, mm -hmm. then that means that the body will work, both mentally and physically, just like a young adult's body. Yes. Um, though, of course, we'll know more because we've been around a long time, and, and so all the advantageous things about ageing will still be retained. Mm -hmm. um, 
the key thing there then is that the um, how long the body lasts is just one aspect of that mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it just goes as a side effect. Yes, thank you. Now, of course, naturally, if these changes are going to come, and hopefully they'll come fairly soon, uh, they're going to change all manner of human existence. Uh, and, of course, we do hear, I think, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, rather absurd arguments made about uh, what are we going to do with the pensions, uh, what are we going to do with the life insurances, uh, or indeed, uh, the classic one, of course, what, there are already too many people on the planet, what are we going to do with all the extra people? Could you tell us, please, how do you, how do you normally answer those questions? I think, actually, that <coughs> it's perfectly reasonable to to examine and to have concerns mm. about the societal and psychological and other consequences that would result from the development of medicine that brings ageing under real medical control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to be turbulent, it really is going to be turbulent. Mm. I think, therefore, the key thing that we have to do in really um, discussing these things is to have a sense of proportion. Right. We have to understand, first of all, that you know, we've had turbulent episodes in, uh, the, resulting from the development of technology in the past. The mm -hmm. Industrial Revolution wasn't exactly smooth, mm. but there aren't many people around these days who would prefer that it, didn't ha it hadn't happened. Right. Um, secondly, we've got to remember that it's very hard to predict how the world's going to be in many, many different mm. ways mm. in the distant future, let's say 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. And supposing that we don't have aging anymore, um, you might say, well, there's going to be problems with having too many people. But hang on, what's wrong with having 7 billion people? What's mm -hmm. wrong is mm -hmm. that each of them has an environmental impact, a carbon footprint and so on. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have to actually ask the question in the context of the possibility of other technologies being developed. Let's mm -hmm. say, for example, nuclear fusion mm -hmm. that suddenly reduces our carbon footprint and then mm -hmm. it becomes the carrying capacity of the planet duly rises. Mm -hmm. Same goes for predictions about fertility, about how many kids the average woman's going to have, mm -hmm. and also, for that matter, about how old they're going to be when they have them, which mm -hmm. is rising all the time and will, in um, most people's estimation, rise a good deal faster at the point where we cease to have menopause as, yes. a, as, a, as a biological deadline, so yes. to speak. Yes. Which is one thing, one aspect of defeating aging. Mm -hmm. um, so there's many, many things that one has to take into account, and that's why I say that the key thing we have to ask ourselves today mm. is whether we are entitled to second guess the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we say, oh dear, there's going to be all these problems, let's not get these, let's not make these problems mm -hmm. because we, um, you know, the, the, our descendants won't want to have those problems, mm -hmm. then what we're doing is we're presuming that those problems at that time are going to be, and to be perceived as, mm -hmm. more important than the problem we have today that we're proposing to solve, yeah. namely aging. Yeah. And the problem today that we're proposing to solve is a rather big problem. Let's mm -hmm. face it, 100,000 people every single day mm -hmm. get sick, usually for a long time, mm -hmm. and eventually die because mm -hmm. of this thing called aging. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very big problem yes. indeed. That's more than two-thirds of all deaths worldwide. In the, um, in the developed world, in the industrialized world, it's 90% of all yes. deaths are caused by aging. It's Gosh. an enormous problem. Mm -hmm. And to say that we shouldn't fix it mm -hmm. is essentially to say that we ought to condemn people to death at that rate, 100,000 yeah. a day, yeah. to an unnecessarily early and unnecessarily painful death indefinitely mm. just because we think that other technologies are not going to be developed or other particular lifestyle um, changes are not going to happen mm. and the consequences would be even worse than the problem we have today, yes. which is simply illogical. Yes, I agree. Yes, thank you, Aubrey, and I agree. And it's interesting, isn't it, that um, deaths by ageing are normally referred to on death certificate as natural causes. So that's actually an enormous part of the problem, that ageing is considered to be something natural, mm -hmm. and that death from ageing is considered synonymous with death from, quote, natural causes. In mm -hmm. other words, death in the absence of the various diseases of old age, like Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease and mm -hmm. most cancers and so on, mm -hmm. that we all know that we don't want. Mm -hmm. The most astounding amount of money is spent trying to directly attack those diseases, mm -hmm. and it's actually wasted money in a very real sense, mm -hmm. because these diseases are increasingly driven by the process of ageing that precedes them, and therefore any attempt to address the disease directly is inherently going to only work for a very short amount of time and only yes. postpone the disease a little bit. Yes. So um, what this means is that if while we carry on thinking of aging as something that's distinct from these diseases yes. rather than the cause of them, mm -hmm. we are always going to be missing the point. 
uh, we have to understand that the diseases of old age are simply aspects of the later stages of the yes. lifelong process that we call aging, mm -hmm. and therefore that the death from those diseases is also death from aging, right. not only death from natural causes. That, that makes sense, thank you. So I'm sure you'll agree with me, Aubrey, when I say that uh, it's our minds that have to adapt to this problem. Uh, at a recent Oxford debate, uh, you, did, you did say that we owe it to future generations to start now and not to pass on this remarkable opportunity. I hope that your SENS work will continue to prosper and highlight the way. How can someone sponsor your work? Well, the first thing I want to say about supporting this work is that SENS Foundation is a public charity. Mm -hmm. so. In the first instance, anyone based in the US can donate directly to the Sense Foundation and get tax relief. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, we have a subsidiary in the UK, in fact, it's a Japan European Union charity, so anyone in the European Union can do the same thing. Okay. Um, uh, certainly, uh -huh. funding is the main obstacle here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a plan called Sense that mm -hmm. is very robust and which we are very optimistic and confident will actually work. Mm -hmm. And we furthermore have the world's leading scientists in all the relevant areas, the component areas that make up Sense, hot to trot. They really mm -hmm. want to work on this. So the mm -hmm. only thing that's missing is the resources to make it happen. Right. And I would estimate that at the moment, over the past, let's say, six or eight years since we've been doing this, the progress we've made has been good, but mm -hmm. it's only been about one third of the rate that we could have achieved with the right sort of level of funding. Right. So that's a really important thing. Yes. Another thing, not just funding, of course not everyone's got money, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is advocacy. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, people who do have money, whether it's private individuals or whether it's the government or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are, they don't, are not in, working in isolation. Mm -hmm. And therefore the general mood about this, the general understanding of both the feasibility and the desirability of defeating ageing with medicine, is something that has to get into the subculture, into, yes. the, into, into the mindset of the general public in order to get people to be more confident about actually moving forward on this. Mm -hmm. And that is why I do so much media, and it's also why I do so many lectures and so on. Mm -hmm. But the fact is it's not just about me here. We've got to get people in general taking up the baton, doing advocacy, talking to your friends, talking to your colleagues, talking to your family, um, you know, talking to your colleagues mm -hmm. in work who may be wealthier than you, getting mm -hmm. them to talk to the colleagues that are wealthier than them, mm -hmm. so as to get this whole thing mm -hmm. really moving. Mm -hmm. a, a, a real networking challenge, but uh, very worthwhile. Thank you. I know you're a very busy man, Aubrey, and uh, I really thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come and talk to us today and sharing a pint with us on a lovely day in Cambridge. So well, it's my pleasure. I'm never too busy for you, Phil. It's great fun. Thank you, Aubrey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.